Hi everybody, Jacob here. Welcome back to the Fragrant Bunker. Today, we shall be reviewing in this wonderful, futuristic, and yet retro, blue, silver, and black background. Well, if you haven't guessed it already, we will be reviewing Rive Gauche by Yves Saint Laurent. This beauty in the new, current, formulation, obviously. Uh, well, not obviously, it could have been a vintage. They did not really change this bottle much, have they, throughout the years. It's still a tin. It's still a can. Uh, it's still aluminum. And um, it's still giving us those early 70s vibes. So before we get to it, subscribe to my channel. You can push the notification bell to get notified every time I post a new video. And um, you can also join me on Patreon, Super Deco Ball spelled together for extra perks. This video is being filmed live in front of a live virtual audience. I live stream several times a week on my main channel. Come check out the live stream and uh, join the live chats. So hi to my co-chatters in the sidebar. Um, <clears throat> let's spray this baby on. Look at that little tin moment. Aluminum, I want to say. Okay, trying to, the ASMR is not ASMRing. Now I already have it on my chest since several hours, so we're getting the dry down out here. But we're, let's um. So the atomizer sprayer, it's it's a vibe. It's kind of it's a cloud. It's all over the place. Mm. Mm. Okay, so nineteen seventy one is the year that Yves Saint Laurent releases a Rive Gauche. And uh, what's the name of um, the perfumer? One doth forget, and I'm really bad at pronouncing also the name. Michel He or Hi? Well, Hi, uh, Michel, I want to say He, Who, He. Um, listen, aldehydes. Let's get to the notes quickly. So. It has a ton of notes, and a lot of people are not really fans of the current formula. The, a lot of the heft of the screechy, you know, it comes in metal, and it does have a metallic aldehydic opening. That heft is kind of subdued in the current formula of uh, Rive Gauche. However, that does not ruin the smell for me. But let's just go into the original breakdown of the notes before we get into the nitty gritty of uh, my interpretation of it. So we have aldehydes um, in the in the opening note, you know, in the in the uh, top notes, and the aldehydes in this one they are sparkly but metallic. They have almost an oak mossy green mossy accord. It's kind of an aldehyde that is um, metallic and chalky. There's like a chalk metal opening, which is more dominant in the OG version, but it's still there in the current. Very aldehydic, very in a way white floral, but also something else, and we're going to get to it in a bit. Green notes, honeysuckle, bergamot, peach, and lemon in the opening notes. Mid notes, rose, iris, geranium, lily of the valley, gardenia, magnolia, jasmine, ylang ylang. It's a kind of a white floral, but also not. <laughs> so it's giving a lot of different things. Uh, some of these ingredients are also similar um, to what could be number 22 by Chanel, but also number five. And then the base notes, oak moss, Tahitian vetiver, musk, sandalwood, tonka bean, and amber. I don't get much of the amber accord in here. You know, this is not a very warm fragrance. It is a cold, floral. If you have the old school version of Rive Gauche, and we're talking 70s, 80s, um, my mom used to wear this a lot. It is, in my opinion, a sheep rub. Now, I know opinions are very different. People say, oh, heavens no, it is not. Well, in the current version, it doesn't give me sheep rub vibes. It is a floral accord. It is a metallic, floral, futuristic accord. Hence, you see this background here. I'm kind of trying to envision the future of Rive Gauche. Why? Well, technically, 
And now that L'Oreal owns them, I don't know if there's a future for Rive Gauche. I think it's still a miracle that they produce it at all, to be perfectly honest with you, because this is not the perfume that would sell today. Not really. So I want to kind of give it a futuristic vibe in the background just because I would hope that they would keep producing it. I am super happy that they still do produce it. I've only ever seen it currently in a 100 ml uh, bottle, as you can see here. But uh, up, to, up until a couple of years ago, they were readily uh, producing this also in 50 ml or the toilette. In the, you know, in the past, uh, there used to be a Parfum version, an Extrait, an Eau de Parfum. Uh, I think they even did maybe an alcohol-free at a certain point. There was a lot of these. There was, they had a beautiful body, uh, bath and body range, soaps, powders, oils, all the whole shtick. It's all gone now. And interestingly enough, this perfume, I've had it several months in this new formulation. Uh, by the way, the batch code, oh, it's hard to see. I think it's 22X21DMAL. Really hard to see there, but it's 22X21DMAL, I do believe. Kind of faded out there, part of the print. And... Um, so I've had it uh, for, for a bit, and the oxygen does do this one wonders. So when you first unbox it and you spray it new, right, out of the box, um, it will be somewhat numb. The smell of it is somewhat kind of encapsulated within itself. But then the more you use it, like I have, I mean, I think there's like half a bottle left. I, I use this a lot it kind of ferments within itself, right? And uh, with time, it, it, it assumes more of, um, of what it used to be, okay? It becomes green. The white flowers become more mossy. Uh, the oak moss or whatever substitute for oak moss they put in here, uh, the vetiver and the oak moss do ferment from the bottom more. So which is a miracle because honestly, it's so hard to find perfumes like this nowadays. No, nobody makes them. And the fact that L'Oreal kind of preserved this nature, this aspect of this fragrance, even in the current formula is amazing because it is dry. It's a dry flower. It's a synthetic flower that doesn't um, mind telling you that it's synthetic. You know, it's, it's a futuristic flower. It, it's a vision of the future. It's a white floral future. And it's telling you, yeah, we'll go, we'll go. That's who I is. You know, shoulder pads, darling. Uh, independent, strength of character. I don't need to ask you for nothing. I'm on my way. I'm on my road. I am doing what I'm doing because I love doing it. And I do not need your permission. I do not care for your opinion. If you like what I'm doing, great. If you don't, whatever. Oh, by the way, if you're liking this video, thumb it up. Helps a lot the channel. Thank you, guys. Uh, and subscribe. I adore Yves Saint Laurent. Okay. Coco Chanel really respected him as well. She used to say, you know, that that's kind of a worthy opponent. She had a respect for him. He had respect for her. He went to her funeral in 1971. There are famous pictures of uh, Yves uh, leaving uh, the church in Paris where the funeral uh, was uh, ha had been taken place and he had a fondness for Coco. Interesting how this one echoes a little bit number 22. Now, it is not Chanel number 22, it, obviously, but it is a Chanel number 22 from the future. Very, very, very fascinating. Minus the incense, you know, minus the vanilla. <laughs> it's kind of like... Envision it this way. If Chanel number 22 would put a metallic warrior futuristic armor on to go into battle for some futuristic Star Trek battle, that's what Rive Gauche would be. Rive Gauche would be that armor that number 22 wears to go to battle uh, in this landscape. I can just envision the warrior running down this uh, runway. Oh my gosh, listen. 
if Saint Laurent would ever call me to be the artistic director, this would be my first runway look, huh? Like that would be the stage, honey. We, we would go there. Oh, we would go there. We would so go there. So, and this is kind of the, you turn it and the lightsaber comes out, you know, you know? and that's the vibe that Rive Gauche is giving me. It is armor. It's a weapon. But it's a floral weapon. And it makes me feel like I can do anything when I wear it. It the beauty and self-determination of this fragrance, it's kind of like self-preserving in a way. It, it reinvents itself constantly in this metallic armor. It's, it's, a, it's a warrior. This perfume is a warrior. It's a warrior. Still in its current formulation today, it's a warrior. And People might say, well, you know, it's, it's, it's a mere shadow of itself of what it used to be. It's not as powerful anymore. I still smell the DNA of Rive Gauche in here. I think for, you know, the, the fact that it is a perfume that is no longer the best seller from Saint Laurent or Yves Saint Laurent, it's a miracle that it's still around. Okay. So I'm telling you right now, get yourself a bottle uh, because it's part of perfume history and new perfumes are not composed like this. This composition is very unique. Rive Gauche comes out in 1971. So this is right at the time where Space Age is kind of ending. We have the whole hippie movement in the 60s. Space Age is ending early 70s. Werner Panton is uh, at the forefront with the Panton chair, the futuristic environments, everything is organic, the shapes are round, the colors are all uh, very playful and colorful. This is right before, this is the early 70s, you guys. We're exiting the 60s, entering the early 70s. Space Age is the vibe. Stanley Kubrick just released 2001 A Space Odyssey. Courage is at the top of the world. Pierre Cardin with Space Age designs as well, uh, Paco Rabin as well. And this is the era in which Yves Saint Laurent releases Rive Gauche. But it is also right before the brown 70s kick in. 70s is also very known for woodsy interior design and decoration, brown hues, kind of muted tones. There is a time... Uh, in the 70s, where color, mm, you know, we're, ta we're talking saturation of orange, red, yellow, blue, it was out of the picture. That comes a little bit later in the 70s. And then it evolves into the disco era. And that's when we then have uh, the opium launch, which is almost a decade after this. Now, in all of this scenario, Women are also fighting more for their rights, more of an emancipation ha happening, uh, entering the workforce, France in particular. They've already entered the workforce, but now it's becoming more of an independence. And Rive Gauche is exactly that statement. It is such an independent perfume that envisions a future where you own your own identity, your own gender, your own sexuality the way you want to. And there is that strength of character still in, in today's version of this perfume, which you might think if you really are a lover of the OG formula from the early 70s, you might think, well, it's no longer there. And I can tell you this, try sniffing out other perfume releases of today modern ones, try to find character in those. Good luck to ya. Good luck to ya. Most of them do not have the character, do not have the strength of character. This thing still delivers a punch, even though it is reformulated. There's something so beautiful about the Ilang Ilang Gardenia Jasmine game happening here because they are not ambrosial. They they go powdery. That kind of oak moss vetiver makes them dry. 
but the aldehydes in here are very, very ozonic, metallic. So what you have is a flower that is constantly borderline to rusting. It, it's almost as if a white floral rusts. It's almost bleeding. There's a bloody metallic vibe going on there, but it's so beautifully blended with, with the florals, with the powders, with the uh, geranium. There's a, the lily of the valley. The, the whole, you know, I don't get much of the peach that they say is in the opening. No, no, no. The peach, you know, which is why I think the OG version is kind of a little bit reminiscent of a Shepra, even though it is not categorized as a Shepra. I just personally see it as a Shepra. But it does have a little bit of a, in my opinion, reminiscence of Mitsuko uh, by Guerlain, which also kind of started that whole fruit Shepra game. You know, that kind of peach accord within the sheep profile. It's a very particular... Go check out my review of Mitsuko to kind of find out more about that. But uh, it almost feels like this is echoing Mitsuko in a little in, in a way. But it's also echoing Chanel number 22. But it's its own thing. And... It's literally this. But maybe a little bit less shiny. A little bit, you know, there's less of that kind of chrome finish. Uh, this one is more mattified. It's, it's a more mattified version. I just envision the future of it becoming more this, even though currently it is a more mattified raw end or raw edged metallic accord. Now, when it comes to florals and metallics, how do you pull it off? Usually you don't. When you try to do something like that, it kind of backfires. It can either go too bitter, it can become quite acidy, it can go quite acidic. Uh, the dry down might collapse within itself and be very mushy and messy. Or, like the case of this masterpiece, bizarrely, it elevates itself. It becomes more pompous, airy. Angelic, the more time passes. Isn't that fascinating? The, and this is where I always, you know, say you really know if a perfume is good when it hits the dry down. Are you enjoying the dry down? Is the dry down messy? Is the dry down somehow mushy, fuzzy, fluffy, and you can't really discern the direction it's going into? Because a lot of the perfumes that um, we're not, either the ingredients are not that you know, top notch, or the blending wasn't really worked up on properly and long enough to get it just right, to get the formula just right. And so the dry down usually, a perfume can mimic good quality in the opening notes. Nowadays, they don't even care about that. Most perfume houses just throw out garbage at you and you just, we'll go, we'll go. They think like we're idiots and we won't realize, you know. But Usually, they can hide, camouflage the bad quality in the top notes. Top notes can still be like, oh, this is interesting, smells good. But then like 40, 50 minutes in, one hour in, if they're not that bad and they're gone within 20 minutes, but let's say the perfume stays on your skin for at least an hour and then you get to the dry down, that's when you find out, uh-huh, okay, this perfume is now giving me a mess or has everything fallen finally into place? Are all the puzzle pieces on the floor and they all just connect together or are, or are all the puzzle pieces on the floor and all messed up, scrambled up and they're not forming a picture? The good perfume forms a picture in its final dry down. This one is forming a very clear picture in the dry down. So I'm warming it up. It is an earthy, kind of dry vetiver with the florals floating around midair. They're not on the ground anymore. You know, it's like, it's a soily metallic smell that is floating in midair. And that's the full blown picture of it. it. It's almost as if this fragrance were levitating. You know, it's kind of like reached its nirvana. <laughs> and to achieve that effect with something metallic that usually you would envision as being heavy metal, 
kind of rocks or whatever solid matter just kind of lays on the ground. Not this one. This one is floating. And that's the full picture of Rive Gauche. It is that arrogant, detached, shoulder-padded monstrosity that is just like, don't touch me, don't... I, you cannot come close to me, you know? But then you realize, actually, in the dry down, the only reason why it's giving off that you can't come close to me is because it, it is floating in midair. You can jump on it, you can fly to it, and then it's approachable, then it's approachable, but you gotta make that effort to elevate yourself to it. Once you've made that effort to come up there where it's at, oof, the party is going down. Then it becomes friendly, happy. It, it becomes um, like, it almost looks at you and says like, where have you been? We've been waiting for you. Why did, why did it take you so long? Once you manage to join that party up on that cloud, you know, <laughs> that metallic cloud, you're just levitating together with the perfume. It is that beautiful. It, it gives me beautiful, beautiful time travel vibes. And the beautiful thing about it is it's very reminiscent, obviously, of the 70s, but it also takes me here in my background into the future. It takes me into the future. Um, Nice memories, you know, nice memories of, of, of times when, because again of this metallic accord, do you guys remember the 70s, the early 70s? You know, cinema was also very particular. Popular movements, the people were more unified. You know, the political movies from the 70s. Oh my God, they would, you would go out of the cinema feeling like crushed because they would show you the injustices of the world, the corruption of the governments. People were mobilizing. There was revolutions going on. There was still hope for the future. We were just exiting the whole hippie movement, right? Woodstock just happened. Like, there was kind of a dream, a vision for the future of unity, of happiness for everyone, justice. It all went, you know, to shite, as we all know. Now we're living in cages. Uh, minds, our own minds are our own cages, and we are just all kind of just being spoon-fed or straw fed the Kool-Aid, but this smells of that freedom, of that time when there was still hope, where there was mobility, the revolution was in the air. It gives you that memory back. It gives you that strength back. And at the same time, it tells you the future is gonna be like that again. We will fight for justice again. We will get the freedom again. We will get the liberty for all again. There's something so nostalgic and beautiful about it. it. I feel like I'm at the movies watching those political movies from the 70s all over again when I'm wearing this perfume. I feel like I'm a part of a bigger movement when I wear this perfume. I feel like I am... I f and unfortunately, I, I'm just feeling it. You know, it's not like I am. <laughs> you would actually need to go to the streets and fight in order to be a part of that movement. You would need to mobilize, right? We're just living in a social media world where it's kind of, you know, you feel like you've done your part by, you know, liking a post on Twitter, uh, supporting this movement or that movement, sharing it. You've done your good deed. Now let's go to McDonald's and have dinner. So obviously there's a lot of that going on. And this is an illusion, but it is memory as well. Perfumes are keys. They unlock memories. They unlock time travel. And this is that beautiful memory of justice in the past and wanting to fight for, better, for a better cause, for a just cause. And it's also a key to the future telling you, you can do this. It can happen again and we can be free again. And as it dries down and you are on the top of this beautiful metallic cloud floating around the world, looking down and seeing what's going down, but you feel like, you know what, up here, it's almost like a utopia. As it dries down, the metal disappears and you're left with that powdery floral accord. And just like that, it vanishes. There's no more platform. And you're covered up by all of these petals of all of these white flowers and you're kind of drifting down back to earth. And the last, last breath of this perfume it just drops a hint, like it snaps its fingers and you wake up 
and you're back in your own home <laughs> doing what you got to do every day in your own routine. But in the back of your head, a seed has been planted. You're waking up. You're finally, truly waking up. Thank you for watching. I hope you've liked this video. This was my Rive Gauche review. I love this perfume so, so much. Highly recommend. It's the Eau de Toilette. But of course, if you can get your hands on the vintage Parfum masterpiece as well. Until next time, don't forget to thumb up this video if you've liked it. And subscribe to my channel if you enjoy this content and you want to see more. Never give up on future love. Bye.